Um, but talk about something that I've previously chatted about in another church, but I feel is really, really relevant and poignant for you guys' freedom today. So as you would have seen from the title behind me, I want to talk about going from a glance to going to a gaze. You know, there's this numbers blessing that's found within the Bible, which many of us took joy and comfort and peace in during the pandemic times. Whether it was through the text or whether it was through a song, it was a timely reminder for so many of us that God's promise and his presence is there for our lives continually. Number six, verse 24 to 26 says this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. The NIV puts it like this, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. And finally, another version, the message version says this, God bless you, God keep you, God smile on you and gift you. God look you full in the face and make you prosper. You know, when I think about this passage, I can't help but think about this image that you're about to see on the screen behind me. And this image is the image of a dad, or even a mum, if you like, of that posture of lifting the child. And the power and the comfort that's behind <coughs> these verses is a wonderful analogy that just like how a parent lifts a child above them, and they're looking into their child's eyes with adoration and strength and affection. You know, all the love and all of the affection and the action that this image shows is something that actually that Numbers verse was trying to get across to us. You know, when my nephew was much younger, I caught this picture of this next one. So this is Sam, my nephew, who now you definitely haven't thrown up in the air because he's huge. But these are my brother's hands. And the joy and the excitement and the adventure that's on Samuel's face as he fully leans in and fully trusts my brother Dan in this moment is something that is just so beautiful to capture and so beautiful to picture. That numbers verse really unpacks and establishes what it looks like to be in God's hands, what it looks like to be a people that go from a glance to a gaze. The Lord bless you and keep you. God wants you to be blessed. He doesn't want you to be separated from him. The Lord make his face shine up on you. And the up on you is such an important thing for us to process today. You know, we don't serve and love a God who lives in high, lofty places and looks down on us. That's the imagery that we always <laughs> think about because even, I guess, we kind of trick ourselves geographically that heaven's up there somewhere. But heaven's here. And heaven is the opportunity and the posture of Jesus looking up to us as well and not looking down on us. Picture it. Picture the Lord's face shining up on you. The Lord lift his countenance to you, says this verse, and the Lord gives you peace. So what does that countenance mean? Well, we know that the countenance means a face. It's God's face. It's God's expression. It's his eye contact. It's his love, it's his support, it's his affirmation, it's his approval on you. And we know that a person's countenance, it can be fallen or lifted up, can't it? It can be described as downcast, like we probably all said to each other, why long face? Or it can be turned towards or turned away from each other. This verse, this numbers verse, is quite simply implying to us today, here for you at Freedom Church, God wants a face-to-face -face encounter with you. And in his holiness, he still made himself known to us by lifting his face to us, not away, but towards. And even more amazingly than that, lifting his eyes up to us. You know, experts say that there are actually five uh, stages of eye contact. And these five stages start with a glance, and then they finish with a gaze. And they always make me chuckle because level one says that um, the glance is an unconscious glance. Now, an unconscious glance is always kind of something that every single one of us has experienced. It might be that we've been in a toilet, or we've been in a lift, or we've been on a plane, and you don't want to look at someone for too long because you don't want to be that creepy person that stares. <laughs> so there's level one, that glance, that unconscious kind of glance. And then there's level two, which is a glance that is conscious, where 
you're looking at someone and you're conscious that you're looking because you're actually starting to maybe get to know them a little bit more. Level three makes me laugh because it's called glance and a half. And glance and a half is kind of that thing where you look and then you look away and then something makes you want to look back again. This is all like clear expert stuff about glance to a gaze. Level four then goes on to double glance, but level five is when we get into this new word, the gaze. And the gaze is when someone looks at you and they look past that normal glance moment um, rather than that past normal looking away moment. And this is a solid two to three seconds of eye contact without them breaking it. And the gaze we know is a clear indicator and a clear large sign of interest. So our eye contact to someone increases when we are full of admiration and interest in someone. It decreases when we dislike or when we're ashamed or when we feel embarrassed. It makes us vulnerable, yet it makes us safe with the right people. You know, I remember a very, very long time ago, late to the game, uh, I flew for the first time across to Jersey to preach. And I was so astounded by the amazement of being up in the air that I found myself just gazing and looking out the window and just thinking, how can anybody not believe in a God who created these clouds? And this gaze just took me into a fog of staring at God's goodness. And as I was in the window seat, I kind of found myself just looking and looking and looking. And I turned around and I kept my gaze. And I looked this way and there was a guy sat in the middle seat and his face was right there. And all he saw was me going. <laughs> <laughs> I was just captivated. I was in the gaze. But friends, that gaze is the same gaze that Jesus gives to us every day. And that gaze is the same gaze that Mary gave to Jesus that day when she intentionally chose to sit at his feet and she intentionally chose to make space. She wasn't a person that glanced. She wasn't a person that even did a double glance. She was a person that made a deliberate choice to go on a journey from being a person that wasn't going to glance, but was going to glance at God. You know, there's a theologian and a guy called Alan, Alan Redpath, and he puts it like this, and it's going to go up on the slide below, above. He says, give up the struggle and the fight. Relax in the omnipotence of the Lord Jesus. Look into his loving face, and as you behold him, he will transform you into his likeness. You do the beholding. He does the transforming. There is no shortcut to holiness. Wow. Isn't that an inspiring quote for us to start to medicate, meditate and chew over today? But the problem is, friends, that if we're really honest with ourselves, all too often we want the transforming without the beholding. And we struggle and we strive for transformation when it can actually be found really easily in one action. You see, God is encouraging us that the true pathway to deep relationship with him is not found in a fleeting glance but in a face-to-face -face gaze. God is encouraging us that the true pathway to peace is not found in inconsistent discipleship, but constantly being a people that behold his face. Mary got this. She understood the importance of abiding. And as Mary sits at the feet of her rabbi, Jesus, since this was a posture assumed by a disciple, she's modelling and showing to us here today that she is comfortable in this space and no one is going to budge her. No one is going to budge her from that place of sitting at Jesus' face because she knew that posture of that face-to-face -face gaze with Jesus was going to radically change everything about who she was and the disciple that she continued to become. I wonder though, friends, what budges us. I wonder though, friends, what diverts our eye contact. I wonder what are the rhythms and the habits that are ingrained within every single one of us that kind of make us glance fleetingly at God rather than have longer face-to-face -face contact with Jesus that turns into the gaze. There's an amazing lady called Ruth Haley Barton and she's written a book called Strengthening the Soul of Great Leadership. And she says in this book about the story of working with IGM, which is International Justice Mission. And she talks about how a couple of years ago, IGM were really, really struggling as a wide national um, ministry. 
they were battling with all sorts of strategies and powers and struggles because the, the level of justice and the level of oppression that was on them was all, all coming all the time. It was hard, it was difficult. And they were always facing these kind of roadblocks, if you like. And she talks in the book where her and the CEO of International Justice Ministry were saying, what are we going to do? How are we going to go forwards? And they realised that all too often that their work as a ministry would veer to, this is what they said, to prayerless striving rather than expectantly abiding. To prayerless striving rather than expectantly abiding. And friends, I'm so challenged by that part of the book. But I know that every single one of us here today should equally be challenged. How many times do we go through life? Do we go through battles? Do we go through decisions with prayerless striving rather than expectantly abiding? Mary and many others that went before her were people that modelled and people that showed to us what it looked like to expectantly <coughs> abide at the feet of Jesus. This numbers verse, this numbers blessing, is one that causes us to deliberately take time over encounters with God. Because he wants face-to-face -face moments with us that don't come from a place of prayer and striving, but they come from a place of expectantly abiding. Well, IGM Ministry, once they realised that they would veer into some of these things, they introduced into their ministry 30 minutes of silence and solitude every day. And this has radically changed this ministry, even to this point. Silence and solitude of 30 minutes a day can seem absolutely extreme and so far for every single one of us today. But I want to encourage you, start somewhere when it comes to creating gaze moments with God. Start somewhere when it comes to actually saying, I'm going to make a choice to expectantly abide with you. Because the truth is, when our <coughs> reference point is Jesus, everything looks different. The things that we've been striving to understand, the problems where you've repeatedly hit roadblocks to solve, the strange relationships and the strained relationships and the lack of peace that maybe some of us currently experience can all be changed in an instant when we make a decision to be whole. When we make a choice to be riveted on Jesus and not what surrounds us, everything looks different. We become a people that find beauty in places where we previously saw ugliness, where we find hope where we previously thought about despair, where we find potential instead of failure. And more than that, as we behold and look to the face of Jesus, we start to become more like him. God is lifting his face to us to give us peace. He doesn't look down on us, he looks up to us. And these face-to-face -face moments with Jesus change everything. And if all of what I've just said to you isn't proof in itself, well, let's just look at a few more biblical encounters. Because, you know, around about this time that this numbers blessing was produced, at the same time that Moses was in this pivotal and critical part of his leadership, and Exodus 33, verse 11, talks about how the Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Isn't that an amazing encounter that Moses had created with God? And let's remember that after that experience, Moses reflected this encounter to those that he led and those that he loved. And he experienced the fullness of God's peace. And that went to person to person and to peace to those around them. You know, and another is found in the Old Testament character of Jacob as well. And it talks about how um, the kind of city name of Peniel, which literally means the face of God in Hebrew. It was a place where Jacob, if you remember, had this kind of wrestling match, which is recounted in Genesis, where his opponent seemed so divine that Jacob claims that he had looked upon the face of God. So pre-Jesus, people were experiencing God's grace and they were experiencing his face being revealed. But in order for God's presence to be truly experienced and received, there has to be something that happens with us. Let me remind you about the story of Zacchaeus in Luke 19 as we jump to the New Testament, which records Jesus entering into Jericho as he was passing through. It says that the wealthy chief tax collector wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short and he couldn't see over a crowd, he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore tree. 
And the story goes on to say that Jesus reached this spot and, listen folks, he looked up. He looked up and he said to Zacchaeus, come down immediately, I must stay at your house today. So Zacchaeus came down and he welcomed him gladly. You know, interestingly, the name Zacchaeus means clean and pure. But actually we know that at that time he was not clean and he was not pure. Yet Jesus still chose in his holiness to lift his face to Zacchaeus. Jesus honours him despite the sin of how he had been um, kind of leading and working and operating in. And that was so often the case when Jesus goes against the grain, he goes against the cultural norm to be a person that says he would look at those that are unlookable, etc. Why? Because of God's compassion through Jesus, but also because of Zacchaeus' conviction. Zacchaeus took responsibility. Zacchaeus made a choice to adjust from just glancing at God to get a higher vantage point of wanting to see Jesus more. And that meal, that impartation of that experience that he had with Jesus changed everything. The Almighty God looks up and has a face-to-face encounter from his chosen place, the world, and he gazes at his beloved Zacchaeus. But Jesus doesn't stop there. You know, as we whistle through the rest of the New Testament, we see the wonderful encounter just before Jesus died and rose again for us for the sake of the world. We see this moment where Jesus humbly got down on his knees and he washed the feet of his disciples. As you think about that posture again, we returned back to that first image as we think about the numbers blessing. Jesus deliberately lowered himself Jesus deliberately looking up to every single disciple, washing their feet, taking an intentional moment with every single one of them to say, you are loved, you matter, I see you, you're important to me, you're worthy of this moment. The woman at the well in John 4, when Jesus had been traveling for so long, and she, in all of her sin, and all of her story then has this incredible encounter with Jesus, which radically changes, not just her, but that Samaria nation. She goes on to become the first woman evangelist, spreading the news of Jesus. But think of the picture, friends. John 4 records clearly that he sat at the well. He's looking up to her. He's looking up to her. And then the bending of Jesus and the woman who's caught in adultery. You know that amazing story when it talks about if anyone who has sinned, he who has sinned cast the first thing. And Jesus deliberately bends down. He draws something cryptic in the sand, which none of us will ever know until we see heaven. But once again, adopting the posture of saying, I'm looking up to you. You see, Jesus does look up to you, Freedom Church. He doesn't look down on you. And as a result, he expects you to behave differently. And as a result, he expects you to venture venture more intentionally, to become a person like Mary, who deliberately sits at the feet of Jesus. And what is the promise in all of this? Well, the promise is all of this is peace. Peace in you and, and peace through you. And so, Two challenges as we look to close today, and then we want to leave some intentional space for God so we can reflect and think about what's been said. Number one, change your posture. Are you letting Jesus have a face-to-face encounter with you? How is your eye contact with him? Are you letting him lift his face to you? How can you, as a woman, how can you, as a man, go from a passing glance, five minutes with Jesus today, that's me, I've done, to then an intentional gaze? Would you dare to pray the boldest prayer in the Bible as far as I'm concerned? It's recorded in Psalm 139 that says to God, see if there is any offensive way in me and lead me to the way everlasting. You see, for God to root out anything offensive, it takes time. It can't be done in a glance. 
It can only be done in the heart there in the face-to-face -face moment where Jesus does his incredible work. And as we remember that amazing quote that I said, we encourage ourselves that at the end of the day, all we need to do is to be holding off Jesus. He's the one that does the transforming. Friends, I feel today for some of us, we have strived for too long in our discipleship when God actually would say there is an easier route. The easier route is to sit and to gaze. And we are so hurried. We are so hurried in this nation. I am so hurried. I need Jesus' forgiveness daily to regroup me into a new way of thinking where I think I'm on the clock with God because we're not on the clock with God. You know, C.H. Spurgeon says this, he said, it's a good rule to look into the face of man. To, it's a good rule never to look into the face of man in the morning till you have looked into the face of God. It's a good rule never to look into the face of man in the morning till you have looked to God. This sums up everything that's been said so well. Imagine if all of our encounters with people, with spaces, places, colleagues, etc., if our starting point, if our reference point could be changing our posture to a face-to-face -face encounter with God, wouldn't everything be different, friends? And finally, a similar, but there's a tiny little difference, change your position. And this is an extended outside kind of responsibility. Where are you sat? Who are you sat with? Where are you positioned? And who do we, as we take on that kind of role model of God and Jesus, who do we need to behold? Who only has our glance when actually they should have our gaze? How do we need to overcome our own presumptions and our own pride and prejudices when we look at other people? How is our eye contact when it comes to other kingdom matters that God would have us involved in? So as we look to be a church today that changes our posture, I want to challenge you that we don't just stop there. To really become like that Mary-like quality, we know that her story doesn't end as she sits at the feet of Jesus. Her story ends as she continues to follow Jesus and as she continues to stand even in his hardest and his most painful moments. Give up the struggle and the fight. Relax. Look into Jesus' lovely face and as you behold him, he will transform you more into his likeness. You do the beholding. He does the transforming. There is no shortcut to holiness. The Lord bless you. The Lord keep you. The Lord make his face shine up on you. The Lord be gracious to you. The Lord lift his face up on you and give you peace. Honestly, friends, Jesus has high expectations for you in this church. He is looking up to you with a hope and an excitement of who you are becoming. You, you won't let him down. All you need to do is take a little bit longer to gaze rather than glance. So let's just pause and take a moment from there. <laughs> Recording stopped. <laughs> <laughs> let's not rush, let's not hurry. What we 